I want to talk to you today for a few minutes about love, respect, and holiness. Can I do that? Because this is, this is in our, um, uh, this is in our series, Love, Marriage, Parenting, which I'll get to probably starting next week, and other chaos. So this is kind of the way life is much of the time. So I want to talk to you today about these three issues, love, respect, and holiness. Very important. Father, I pray that you would settle our minds, cause us to receive for every couple, for every single person. Lord, I pray that you would bless us today with your word, and we'll give you praise and glory for it. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Ephesians 5.33 says, Each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself. His wife must respect her husband. 65% of married couples interviewed said their biggest issue is the issue of communication. 80% of wives says he doesn't listen to me. Raise your hand if, that, if you were interviewed on that. Wait a minute, Carol. I just listened to you for about five minutes up here. 70% of husbands issue is their wife nags at them. Gentlemen, okay, you better not. Uh, so it really isn't about listening. It, it's, it's not about nagging. It's, it's really not even about understanding. It's about communication, how to hear each other. Think of the idea of communication against the back, backdrop of the story we've been talking about for the last three or four weeks, which is the book of Hosea. I'm not going to spend much time there. just want to remind you. And if you don't have these CDs and you'd like to listen to them, I think they have some copies out there. And if not, if you're listening in the back and you have a chance to make a few, you might want to do that. Um, we've been talking about the story of a preacher and a prostitute, man of the cloth and a woman of the night. We've been talking about this story of Hosea and Gomer. And I think she could have had a better name than that, but otherwise, I mean, it works out okay. As you know, God instructs Hosea to go find a prostitute to marry. The marriage is an illustrated sermon by God. Their life is an illustrated sermon about Israel's tendency to love God and then leave God and to come back to God and leave God and love God and leave God. Chapter 1, Hosea selects Gomer and they have three children. Chapter 3, she's gone back to prostitution. Hosea goes and finds her and buys her back out of the slave market and brings her back home. And I want, you, I want to let you in on a little revelation I had in reading it again just this week. Not one time, I never noticed this before, not one time, well, well let me tell you, you know, we, we know what Hosea said, we know what God said. Do you know what Gomer said in this book? Let me read it to you. Nothing. Not one word. There's not a word from Gomer. Not one recorded word spoken by her in 14 chapters. God talks. Hosea talks. I wonder why. Gomer says nothing. It's interesting to me. As I was reading, I thought, wow. Uh, she doesn't say anything. So there must have been some meaningful communication because the Bible teaches us about what communication means. First Peter 3, 7 says, In the same way you husbands give honor to your wives, treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She's weaker than you, but she's your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should, and your prayers won't be hindered. I mentioned that last week. If you want to pray, treat your wife well, gentlemen. So here's some truths from the book of Hosea. Let's quickly go through these so I can move to another area that I want to talk to you about. You can't talk it. If you can't talk it, then you can't walk it. It's just the way it is. So the story talks about the communication, and without communication, a relationship cannot be healthy. So I don't know the problems. The Bible doesn't speak to that. The truth is, your relationship will only go as far as your communication. And I want to talk a lot about that today. Communication is the transportation that moves you from where you are to the destination where you should be. Without it, you'll travel along together, but you'll never reach the destination that you need to reach. The second thing, intimacy hinges on communication. The society we live in has tried to convince us that intimacy uh, relies on sex and sexual activity and a sexual relationship. But Hosea and Gomer experienced intimacy, but their story doesn't bear out the fact of communication was there. Intimacy is only accomplished in your life by communion. 
which is also communication. You've heard it said that whoever has your ear has your future. Well, whoever has your ear also has your heart. That's where a lot of adultery begins. Someone listens to the other person. Someone starts hearing. So communication, both from the speaking and the hearing side, are extremely important. So what about, uh, you say, well, we don't talk anymore. You know, I'm not talking about communication that a lot of you do, which is, you know, rolling your eyes or shrugging your shoulders or wagging your finger at the other person. I'm not talking about uh, physical communication. I'm talking about the beginning when you had that first moments together. Those moments when you were couldn't get off the phone. Those hour-long conversations. You know, like, you hang up. No, you hang up. No, you hang up first. No, you... Some of you are laughing because you remember that. Ten-page love letters. We still got all ours, by the way, Carol. Through communication, we win commitment. Without it, we lose commitment. But over time, we tend to grow silent because in our normal daily routines, we think the other person already knows everything there is to know about us. After 56, 57 years, what else is there to say? There's a lot to say. Because my sound reveals my soul. What I say tells you who I am. If I can't talk to you, I can't connect with you. If you can't hear me, then you won't heart me. Communication. Third thing is, God's voice sometimes sounds a lot like your spouse's voice. Have you noticed that? God's voice sounds a lot like Carol sometimes. In fact, this church is here because God used Carol to say, Gary, stop dilly-dallying around. It's time. It's time to do what you've been considering. It's time. And I think it's apparent in the book of Hosea. I don't think Gomer ever grasped the fact that her husband was God's mouthpiece to the nation. I don't, I, we, I don't know that, but I can't find any indication that Gomer ever knew that he was speaking God's voice to her or anyone else. Others seem to recognize it, but evidently Gomer missed it somewhere. Gomer had listened to Hosea somewhere, but if she had really listened and really heard, she would have heard the voice of God speaking into her life. A lot of other examples. If Eve would have listened to Adam, she might not have taken a bite of that fruit. If Gary had listened to Carol, he might not have made some mistakes along the way. God's given you a person in your life. And if you don't hear your spouse, it's pretty sure that you're not really listening for God. It goes both ways. Husbands to wives, wives to husbands. So if we're going to embrace this truth, we've got to be willing to listen, to honor our spouse's voice, to evaluate her opinion and thoughts. Doesn't mean you have to do everything they say, but at least listen to the nuggets that God wants you to hear within that. Because you don't see yourself as you really are. How many already know that? That spouse can see things in you that you never see because we all have blind spots. Could it be that the silent season with God that you're going through now is because you're not listening to what your spouse has to say? Not hearing God? Perhaps the silent season you're personally struggling is because you've been willing, unwilling to hear the wisdom of God through the voices that are speaking into your life. And for those of you who are not married, it could be a close friend. It could be a mother or a father, or a child, possibly a grown child. If we want to improve our relationships, we've got to improve our ability and willingness to practice communication, which is communion. Let's develop some communication skills. In an Emerson Egrich book called... Uh, it's called, uh, what's it called? It's called something. Uh, I'll think of it in a moment. <laughs> anyway, I found a story I wanted to tell you because I mentioned the heart reader and, and Wayne Smith went online and found the book and I don't even have it anymore. So it'll be interesting to read it again at some point. But I found a story about a couple who were to celebrate their 10th wedding anniversary. They were supposed to uh, have a celebration that evening and go out to eat. Many, many times that husband through those 10 years had forgotten their anniversary. She'd remind him with little hints, you know how you ladies do, uh, you know, boy, I wonder what year this is that we've been, how many we've been married. And, but on their 10th wedding anniversary, with no hints at all, he remembers. He rushes down to the store, to the Hallmark store, and he looks through the cards. There's just so many of them. He's blown away. And one colorful card 
uh, catches his eye and he grabs it, looks at it, reads the verse in it and says, yes, that's her. I'm going to do that. No doubt about it. And so he grabs it, pays the clerk, hurries home rejoicing. He's finally remembered the anniversary and got a card. She's there when he comes home. So he sneaks into the bedroom and he writes a little note at the bottom and he writes a couple of hearts on top of that. Comes out and hands his wife the 10th anniversary card. Everything's hunky-dory. It's all good. She's beaming from ear to ear. He remembered. I didn't even tell him. Wow, she's so happy. She can't believe it. She tears open the card and starts to read. And then as she reads it, she gets to the bottom of this and it's like her countenance changes. Her eyes that have been bright with loving energy turn cold and her beaming countenance becomes sour and dark. And he says, what's wrong? What's wrong, honey? She says, nothing. Well, there's got to be something wrong. Nothing's wrong. No, nothing wrong. Well, well uh, you were happy a moment ago. What, what is, it? Uh, is it? Did you not like the card I got you? Well, she said, well, it's okay. It's okay uh, for a birthday card. <laughs> Tell you more of that story in a minute. I found a problem that's universal. Wives are made to love and they're made to receive love. They desire and expect love from someone. But many husbands fail to deliver. The problem I hear from wives when we talk to them is he doesn't love me. He doesn't love me like he used to. He doesn't love me. There's, but there's also the other half of the equation. Husbands don't say it much, but they're thinking it. and They're thinking she doesn't respect me. Just as wives are created to be loved, husbands are created to be respected. They need respect. They expect someone they're close to to show them respect. And many wives fail to deliver on that purpose, that, that, that uh, idea. Um, there's a picture that I have that I want you to put up, if you will. And it's a cycle. It's called the crazy cycle. Without love, she reacts. Without respect, he reacts. Over and over again, round and round it goes. And when you get into this crazy cycle, it's, it's marital craziness. It's a senseless circle. A cycle that has thousands of couples in its grip and it won't let go. The question from the woman is always, how can I get my husband to love me as much as I love him? The question from the husband is, why doesn't she respect me when I'm always trying to please her, when I'm working hard to provide for her, when I'm doing everything I can to make her happy and and." Ephesians 5.33 from the Passion Translation. So every married man should be gracious to his wife just as he is gracious to himself. And every wife should be tenderly devoted to her husband. Paul's clearly saying wives need love. Husbands need respect. The need for love, the need for respect has everything to do with the kind of marriage you're going to have. Here's a Gary phrase of Ephesians 5.33, okay? Husband is to obey the command to love, even if his wife does not obey the command to respect. Uh oh, this is what Paul really said. And a wife's to obey the command to respect, even if the husband does not obey the command to love. You, you say, you mean a husband's call to love a wife that's disrespectful and always talking down to him? Yes, yes. And there's no justification for a husband to say, after she starts respecting me, then I'll show her love. No, nope, that's not the way it's supposed to work. Or not for a wife to say, after he proves he loves me, then I might respect him. Nope. And I know when a husband feels disrespected, it's hard to love a wife. And I know a wife feels the same way when unloved. It's especially hard to respect a husband who has not shown her love. So now let's get back to the story. So he asks, what's wrong? Well, there's nothing wrong. He says, yes, there is. I see it. You didn't like the card. And she says, well, it's not bad for a birthday card. So as you might guess, the conversation headed downhill from there, right? He said, you're kidding. It can't be. It was in the anniversary section. It was right there with all the others. He grabs the card from her hand. He said, no way. This is unbelievable. She says, no, you're unbelievable. And you can see it escalate. Now, he's still full of goodwill. He's trying his best to make it through this. This is a special day, a special event. He finally remembered their anniversary without any nudging, without any hints. He bought her a present and a card. He says, well, honey, I made an honest mistake. Just give me a break. She says, well, huh, give you a break. An honest mistake? Right. It was an honest mistake, all right, because you don't care about me. 
She said, I can guarantee if you took your car down to the detail shop and they put a stripe on it and it was a quarter of an inch out, you would notice that because you care about your car more than you care about me. Ever heard those conversations? Ever had one? <laughs> Husband can't believe it. Now he's moving from feeling guilty, which he felt. Now he's getting angry. His pulse rate's going up. What was supposed to be a loving celebration, what was supposed to be a wonderful dinner, has escalated into this gritty conversation. He says, I made an honest mistake, right? Good grief, can't you even forgive me for that? She, you bought a birthday card on our 10th anniversary. You expect me not to be upset? I'd rather you hadn't bought me any card at all. Well, next year I won't, and I won't get you a present either. And he slams the door and walks to his room, and she goes to hers, and they spend their anniversary night, their 10th anniversary, in separate rooms on different ends of the house. It's a crazy cycle. Put that picture back up again. You see, without love, there's a reaction coming from a woman. And without respect, there's a reaction coming from a man. These two work hands, and it triggers itself. It's just the way it is. So if we don't understand this, it goes round and around, and the enemy starts creating division and trouble and a stronghold in the marriage that's difficult to ignore that you can't get past. This senseless roundabout is found in Ecclesiastes 7.25. In the New Living Testament, it says, Wickedness is stupid, and foolishness is madness. And that's what a conversation like the one we've just outlined is. It gets out of control. Everybody's feelings are hurt. Now, there are big differences between men and women. Uh, and, and they see things and they hear things differently. I think the woman looks at the world through uh, pink sunglasses with pink hearing aids. And the man looks at the world with blue sunglasses and blue hearing aids. Okay? And men and women, have you noticed, can look at precisely the same situation or event and see things totally differently. When the wife sees her husband purchase the birthday card, her spirit deflates. She thinks he's forgotten that anniversary before, but this is just the last straw. And she sends him an angry message. Of course, it's in pink sunglass code that he's supposed to read. But he's looking at it through blue sunglass code. He, he's wearing the wrong glasses to figure out what she just said. He's guilty, then he's irritated. He made an honest mistake. She should give him a break, right, ladies? No. What? Maybe I'm preaching through blue sunglasses up here. I don't know. I, something's wrong. But the fact that happens after that's important here. She assassinates and attacks his character. She's telling him, He's wrong, he's stupid, he's dumb, he can't make the right decision. She's bringing him down. No respect. At the same time, she's feeling like he didn't love me enough to even read the card all the way through. Card wasn't really the issue though. It was feeling unloved for the woman and disrespected for the man. Blue sunglasses, blue hearing aids, pink sunglasses, pink hearing aid. He stood up, tried to take up for himself. That's what a man does. He couldn't verbalize it. Men don't verbalize like you ladies do in general. You can over talk them. Uh, and what he's hearing in the blue hearing aids is not what's coming out through the pink sunglasses. So he's still a man. Feels like he has to prove that he's a man. So essentially two good-willed people wound up spinning in this crazy cycle that I've shown you with no clue about how to slow it down or stop it. Here's the irony of this. Both those people love each other a great deal. They've been through a lot of wars together and battles that they fought and won. Maybe they had children. I don't know. It doesn't, you know, that, that story doesn't go that far. It's just a story. But I'll tell you this. They're hurt. They're angry. But they still care deeply for one another. So how do we remedy this? Rather than spending our anniversaries in separate rooms, if you don't learn how to control the crazy cycle, it goes round and round, and where it stops, nobody knows. A lot of times I ask husbands, does your wife love you? If I'm talking to them, yeah, I believe she does. Does she like you? And they'll go, no. Many times, no. She doesn't like me. In his opinion, the lady who was the admiring, adoring, ever-approving woman of his courtship, when she, he was courting her, has become one who no longer likes him. 
doesn't respect him, doesn't approve of him, and she lets him know it. So the husband decides he'll motivate his wife not to disrespect him anymore by withholding the love that she so desperately needs, which separates them even farther. The key to moving a good marriage forward is a change of heart. Now, if you were here on Thursday night, how many of you were here Thursday night? I talked about the obedient heart. If you weren't here Thursday night, we have church at 630. Uh, beyond that, there's probably a CD out there that you can get. Marital health rests in the heart. All you can do actually is focus on you. But when you get your heart right, when your heart lines up with the word, and what you do out of that heart is what God asks us to do, it will bring the two parties closer. And when, when you enter God into the midst of this, then you can truly have communion, communication. This passage in 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, Let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Let me ask you a question. What if God's primary purpose for you in marriage, what if God's purpose for bringing Carol and Gary together was not to make us happy, but to make us holy? For us to actually encourage one another in following God's plan for each other's life? I think God's not nearly as interested in our comfort as He is our character. I think God would rather have you be selfless than selfish. He'd rather have you have great character rather than be comfortable. If God could choose for you, what do you think it would be? Happiness or holiness? Holiness. Sometimes there are moments in our lives when we have to choose that way. It can't always be both ways. You can't always be happy and holy at the same time. Have you ever met a self-centered person who did not have their own interests, comfort, and happiness at the top of their priority list? What about me? What makes me happy? And when a marriage is set up on the basis of, I'm marrying you because I believe you're going to make me happy, it probably won't work. Marriage is to be God-centered. It's called holy matrimony. To be holy for us, that's what God wants. I, I think if you realize that the things that irritate you from your spouse may not be so much about her or him as it is about what needs to be changed in you. And I always want to evaluate that, and I don't do it all the time. I don't know very well when I want to do it. But when I hear something from my wife, I believe that little bit of sandpaper sometimes is to hit a rough edge off Gary McSpadden. And if I refuse to listen to that, and I bow up, and I go, hmm, then there's something inside me that needs to be worked on. Because God gave her me to help me be more holy. And you may not sense it that way when that sandpaper is rubbing against that one spot where you're at fault. But that's the way God works. See, it's a very irritating idea because you know what? Our spouses can sometimes be jerks. Have you noticed that? <laughs> we can. Every one of us in this room, we're married. And if we're not married, we still can be jerks. But we can do some very irritating and hurtful things. We can say stuff that we shouldn't say. But, and, and in those moments, holiness seems like a foreign language to us. But you've got to try to learn to speak that language of holiness fluently. Whether you're married or single, God wants you to become holy through the circumstances of your life. Again, let's read it. Let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. You can't be said to be a holy person if you're just holy in one aspect of your life and unholy in others. Either you're holy or you're not. God is not half holy and half unholy. He's all holy. He is a holy God. It's all or nothing. So as God perfects His holiness in us, it will pervade every area of our lives and He may just use a spouse to do it. Remember I said, sometimes the voice of God sounds like your spouse's voice? Irritating as that may be sometimes. Some people are thinking, I could really be all God wants me to be if I just get rid of this loser that I'm hooked up with. No, you won't. No, you won't. 
And if you're looking around trying to find another place to go with your marriage life and say, well, that person over there on the other side of the fence, that looks a lot better. Won't be. It's about you. It's not about them. Think about this with me now. It's about you. When you get holy in your heart, Madison Avenue's done a great job of convincing us that our problem lies in what's out there. Our current shampoo, our air conditioner, our computer, our toothpaste, or our toilet paper, whatever it is. They convince us all we need to do is make a change and everything will be hunky-dory and just wonderful. Wrong. Because the change has to come from inside us. Not what's around us. Not who we're hooked up with. Not who we're married to. Not the friends that we have. It's about us. To get married, you've got to believe you found Mr. Right and Mrs. Right. To stay married, you've got to keep believing that and you've got to do that in faith. There'll be days when <laughs> Mrs. Wright doesn't seem so right and Mr. Wright seems to be really wrong. And when, when things go bad in a marriage, have you noticed that the spouse that would say something like, well, other people just like him so much, that's because they don't know him like I do. If they knew him, they'd be as disgusted as I am. You ever thought that? I mean, or we think, what exactly do people see in her anyway? Here's a hint. What did you see in her what did you see in him when you first got married? That's probably what they see. But through the years of rubbing sandpaper on each other, you have created this lack of holiness to accept the voice of God into your marriage and your life so that God can change you. Don't give in to that little voice that's always restless, always telling you to move on, always something better out there, always some change. In Mark 7.20, Jesus is talking and he said, it's what comes out of a person that pollutes obscenities, lusts, thefts, murders, adulteries, greed, depravity, deceptive dealings, carousing, mean looks, slander, arrogance, foolishness, all these are vomit from the heart. Ooh. Now that's the message. It would be a lot, a lot softer in some of the other translations, but I chose this one on purpose. Because a lot of people in a marriage situation, their mouth is full of vomit. And the way they speak to one another. And there is no love and there is no respect. This is the source of your pollution. Because what's inside of us, that's what comes out. And over Matthew 12, he said, The mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good. And the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. So Jesus here in two places says that we have a heart problem. We vomit in our hearts and it will come out of our mouths. So you've got to clean your heart up. If you say, that's just the way I am. Well, you need to have God change the way you are. Because He can make a new heart. We played that video earlier. Because of all the things God's done for us, I can live. I'm a new creation in Jesus Christ. The deepest truth of who we are is reflected in our words and our actions. It's usually an evil attitude that messes up relationships. It's the way we view the world and what it tells us and the way we receive it. This junk in the heart that Jesus talked about, it's like Limburger cheese right under your nose and it's stuck there. And you wake up in the morning and you think, this room stinks. You look over at your wife or husband and you go, and they stink too. Step out in the living room and go, wow, this room stinks too. Go out in the open air and you go, well, the whole world stinks. I mean, the, the problem is not the world, it's not your spouse, it's not the living room. We are the ones who are causing the stink. If your marriage stinks, it's probably not your spouse. It's probably you. That's the bottom line truth of what Jesus was saying. There's no magic relationship beyond this one. There's no utopia. There's no greener grass on the other side of the fence. I believe God's main intention for marriage, like every other circumstance in life, is not to make you happy. And you shouldn't even look at your marriage that way. It's to make you holy, righteous, the righteousness of God in Christ. And now's the right time. Now's the day to allow God to begin to change you. If you'll make the determination that if you've got a heart filled with junk, you need God to shine His light down inside that heart of yours. If you'll stop pointing to other people as your problem and the problems outside and realize the real problems, the only ones you can fix are the ones that are inside you. You can't fix your wife or husband. You can't even fix your children. They're, if they're grown, they're making their own decisions. And you shouldn't feel uh, guilt 
for the fact that what they're doing, they've made their own choices. You may have had a hand in causing them to go in the wrong direction, but you can call them back into the house of God, back into the kingdom of God, and you've got to stop looking for the cure outside yourself. Well, my kids do this because they're just rah, 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 or my husband, or my wife, or my friend, or my boss. Hey, you better start looking inside. You better check your heart. There may be some vomit in there that's coming out of your mouth. We need God to help us see our own sin, our own shortcomings, our own problems. We need God to help us care more about perfecting holiness in our own lives than creating some change or difference in our spouse. And we need God to help us understand and learn to live in the reality that He's more interested in your holy marriage, your holy matrimony, than He is in your happy matrimony. In the message, that same verse said, let's make a clean break with everything that defiles or distracts us, both within and without. Let's make our entire lives fit in holy temples for the worship of God. There's a lot of truth to this. When we are willing to allow God to change us, to make us holy, even though sometimes we don't feel happy. I mean, no, happiness is a feeling. Happiness is the way you feel. Holy is who you are. That's the difference. God, I want to be holy. If you're married, take your husband or your wife's hand right now. Would you do that? God, I want to be holy. If you got a friend sitting by you and you're good friends, you can take their hand, men or women. It's okay. <laughs> but I just want us to pray for a moment. And believe God that He will do work inside us in a way that will create His righteousness, His holiness. And that we will allow our spouse, our friend, our partner to, if God wants, to be the sandpaper in our lives, to knock off the rough edges and to help us to be created in His image. Father, I pray today for this congregation. I pray for Carol and me and every other couple, every other person, every single person here. Lord, the people in their lives that you've brought into their lives who are the sandpaper in their lives. We're knocking off the rough edges to help us to be more like your son Jesus. But that's what you said in your word, that your purpose is to make us like Jesus. And Lord, if you use Carol to do that for me or me to do that for Carol, God, I pray in, in the name of Jesus today that we'll be able to receive it without vitriol without hurt or anger Lord we never need to be disrespectful or unloving or unforgiving so as long as we're living like that and you use our words or our statements or our actions to help one another that's your purpose help us to be holy Lord holy let your holiness rest upon us give you our lives today Help us to love one another more and respect one another more and understand one another more, Father. Bless us. Lord, we take off the pink glasses and the blue glasses and we begin to see through your glasses, through the lens of the Holy Spirit. That allows us to understand and forgive where we've been unforgiving in the past. So I pray that over every family here today, every person in this place today, that your power and your grace would come through us. Thank you for your mercy. Lord, we deserve death and you gave us life. We deserved an eternity without you and you gave us heaven. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in lives today, right here in this place. Those who are watching at home, thank you, Lord, for working in us, working your way and your will and your love through us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.